Doing pretty good. I just got home like five minutes ago. <laughs> Very cool. <clears throat> oh, I appreciate you. Alright, it looks like uh, Clutch is AFK, which is also very or, cool. Uh, oh. He might be AFK or he can't hear all because he's in streamer mode. Yeah, yeah. Well, I meant AFK on stream. Oh, I see. Okay, so as soon as he gets back, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Yeah. Yo, what's up? Yo. Yo. How's it going? Uh, slightly tilted, but I'm doing all right. I watched that game. I understand. <laughs> all right. Um, so this is episode two of Honor Bound. Um, uh, very appreciative again to Clutch and Setmix for taking time out of their schedule to be on the podcast. Um, unfortunately, Danny was not able to make it. He was feeling uh, not feeling great today. So hopefully he will improve and get better and we'll have him on on a uh, future episode. Weak. <laughs> what a pussy, dude. <laughs> Unlucky. I don't. I don't know. But um, I, either way, uh, today the topics that I want to cover um, are going to revolve around um, uh, scrims, uh, competitive mindset, and basically the dominance of of UDDA and Hotspot when they were a team. Obviously, they're not a team anymore. Um, and just to kind of get your guys' perspective as two of easily the best players in this game, um, you guys have a lot of insight to uh, to give in terms of, you know, why you guys are so dominant, um, in the, how what it takes to be a competitive player, basically. Uh, so, Setmix, I'd like to start with you. Um, what, uh, what is it about uh, Hotspot and UDDA that made you guys uh, such a dominant team in the uh, 4v4 and 2v2 sphere? Um, well, uh, in Hotspot's case, I feel like those are two separate and entirely different cases, because Hotspot kind of, the team was formed after a lot of big teams kind of disbanded. Like, back in the days, you'd have old UDA, you'd have Scorebrand's team, and so on. And just after these teams disbanded, Hotspot really started improving and started, like, actually playing in tournaments and doing well consistently. Mm -hmm. So I do think that that is part of the reason why they were dominant for a certain period of time. Um, after Clutch and I teamed up again, it took us only a short amount of time to actually catch up to them again. I feel like that's primarily to the amount of experience Clutch and I have. We played in so many tournaments together, so we already have so much synergy built up together. We have so much... We Like, when Clutch and I play together, we don't even have to communicate anymore because we just know what the other person is going to do. Mm -hmm. So I feel like synergy is really a, a factor that many people underestimate because good synergy can really make a huge difference in any game you play. So I feel like that's definitely one of the main aspects as to why Hotspot and UDDA were the most dominant teams for their time period. Um, another factor, in my opinion, is also um, the amount of practice you have, not just in scrims, but also like, we do practice for ganking specifically, we do practices for anti-gangs, like we don't just practice the game mode itself, we also practice specific instances within the game mode and try to figure out what is optimal to do and what can we optimize in these situations to have better outcomes. So I feel like those are the main as ma main aspects as to why those two teams were the most dominant. Okay, so kind of sounds like a, a combination of proper team synergy and practicing the right things, not just yeah. the game modes, but the, the nuances in those game modes. Yeah, correct. Oh. Cool. Okay. Um, Clutch, do you have uh, do you have anything to add? Like, uh, you've been with multiple teammates before in with UDDA. So how um, how does it how does it compare from at the beginning to to now with your dominance in the four v four scene? I mean, if if you look at all of the teams that have been like dominant for any period of time in Dominion, <clears throat> there's always been like a common trend, which is pretty much what Semix already addressed and it's it's basically like a combination of experience and like practice time <clears throat> so for example the, the first dominion team that i guess was like really dominant like i don't i don't ca uh, class um storm as being very dominant because 
they weren't like they the, they lost to to my old team like me y'all Hansax and Alla in that one tournament <clears throat> and then when Alla left our team to join their team like Dominion tournaments just died because there was literally no other Dominion tournaments like the first really dominant team to come about was um was Scorebrand's team like, it was Scorebrand Bodrat uh who were the other two members Semix uh, Scor- wasn't it Rain? Score, but no, wait, wait. At first, at first, no, no, no. At first, they had Vinx and Aller. I'm yeah, sure. but th- th- but they weren't very dominant though, because you remember the the, the tribute tournament you won, where you beat us in the finals. We oh, knocked yeah, them yeah. out in like the second round. Like that, that wasn't mm. their dominant team. The do- dominant the, team was Weir, Bobran, Bodrat, and someone else. They, they were dominant Rave, with. Right? They, they were really good with um, Bod, Score, Rave, and Weaboo. But didn't they also have a team with Kihu at some point? I'm not sure. I can't remember, but I, th- I think it was I think it was the Raven team that was dominant, right? That was the one that they won multiple. Yeah, that was with. yeah, definitely. And then and then after that, it was that was when UDA came about, and that's when we became really dominant, and we won like I think we won every tournament we played in for like three or four months straight without dropping like a single uh, a single game. Um, yeah, but yeah, like the the common trend between those teams was just like a combination of like experience and practice, like. For example, when UDA were dominant, we were pretty much one of the only teams that were that we weren't just scrimming or like doing one v ones. You know, just like basic practice. We were doing specific gank practice with the, all of the different characters. We were doing specific like anti gank practice. So we, for example, like when I was practicing Berserker, when I when I was the first person to win with the rework Berserker in the tournament, like we I would literally just sit with like uh, against Aller and Vinx, and I would just play like one v two, so they would get to practice their ganks, and I would get to practice like anti ganking and stuff. And we would we would dedicate quite a lot of time to that. We would dedicate like an hour or two, uh, like every couple of days, or if not every day, like before a big tournament, doing that if we couldn't get scrims. And all of that practice like really helps a lot. It helps you understand like how people are going to be optimally setting up ganks. It h- helps you to understand what the best way to to really hinder these ganks are to make it harder for people to set them up how to get damage in and i think that like experience obviously helped us at the time but i think the reason why you see players continue being at the top is because we've put in all of this practice and it's like once once you've learned like if you if in any particular matter you've learned or pretty much everything there is to know about like certain um certain like top tier characters uh like when whenever there's changes you know because there's there's never like humongous changes in front of there's never like mm-hmm. giant changes to like seven or eight different characters that really throws them like up the meta it's very easy once you've learned the entire meta at any one point to then just adapt to changes yeah which is why it's it's easy even if players like take breaks like take scorebrand for example he took a pretty big break but then when when he made the team with um with me, Legion, and uh, Danny, that even though Hotspot had been continuously practicing, uh, we still won. Like I think out of the three times we played them in tournaments, we won two out of three times, even with like minimal practice. Uh, because Scorebrand, like you know, he had at one point learned everything that the like the game had to offer. When he came back, even after a few months, there hadn't been like giant changes to the game, so it was he still understood the game to a point where it was a lot uh, he had much deeper knowledge compared to a lot of players so it was very easy for him just to to practice like brush off the mechanical rust because at, at the end of the day like your knowledge isn't going to get rusty about the game it's it's just going to be your like your mechanics like your execution your reaction times things like this that are going to get rusty it's not your game knowledge mm-hmm. so after just consistent scrimming for a couple of weeks score all like was already a top tier player again and i think that's kind of why you see the same players being at the top because they've put in the time, they've they've learned the game to such an extent that it's it's easy just to adjust to like a couple of changes, and it only takes like some consistent scrimming for a couple of weeks just to brush off all of that uh, all of that mechanical rust. Okay, so just basically a, a fair amount of in-game knowledge that's not going to necessarily go stagnant. Some of it might change because there aren't because of the patches, even though they're few and far between. Um, okay, so then what um what then is the biggest difference between UDDA and Hotspot because most of the time when you guys would clash I'm pretty sure UDDA has more wins in Hotspot than fours in in twos um so yeah. what uh, what in your guys' opinion uh clutch I'll start with you was the biggest difference um, uh, um I mean well 
in, interestingly enough, even though we have a winning record versus Hotspot, we've never played with a full team versus them either. Like, we've never had, like, a dedicated fourth member. Like, we have one now, now that Otto's joined us. Mm -hmm. But literally all the times we beat, we beat them in tournaments, the f fun enough, the first time we beat them in tournaments, we had two subs. Like, Crack was ill, so it was literally just me and Setmix with Kawhi and Eternity filling in for us. But I think... The reason why we always had the edge is, again, because at the end of the day, like, me and Setmix have a lot more experience than a lot of the members of Hotspot did. Like, you look at you look at Barraquette, for example, he's definitely a top player, but yeah. when it comes to actual, like, experience and his knowledge of Dominion, he he hasn't been playing at, a, like, a high level for as long as, like, me and Setmix have, particularly me. And he's, his knowledge of Dominion, again, is locked into one character. Like Setmix, for example, plays multiple characters, and I, I can play pretty much every character if needed at like a high level. So, yeah. like if if for example the meta ever does change, for example with this patch with Hitokiri becoming like extremely strong now that you can't just nullify his offense as easily, I can easily swap to said character because I have experience like playing all the different roles. You know, I've I've played, I've played a mid clearer for for udda like you know i played nabushi i played kensei whatever i've played a ganker because i played shaman back when uda was uh was the top team you know i've I've played uh, i've played like back capping characters you know i played raider like a back capper i used to play berserker that way with bounty hunter and Re the revenge tax over the trap setup mm -hmm. um so like i've got experience with all of these different things whereas like with hotspot they had a lot of experience but they had a lot of like specialist players for example, Skeptic only knew how to play in the minion lane. Danny also only knew how to play in the minion lane. Barrack pretty much only knew how to play Berserker at a really high level. Like he he could he could play Prior and Shaolin wow. But when it came to really maximizing them like the making the most of their potential, like playing them optimally, he didn't play either of them like close to as well as he played Berserker, because he was the best like Dominion Berser like Berserker, but that was pretty much all he could do at like an extremely high level. So when we saw things like Raider coming about, we we utilized the Raider and we could implement it very easily because of like the said experience. Like I picked up Raider straight from a, like a mid lane character. We picked up Eternity to play Nabushi in mid. And after like a week or two of scrims, I was already playing the character very well. And that's that's something that like Hotspot couldn't do as easily. You know, they, they stuck with their they stuck with their like Shinobi, Berserker, uh, like Nabushi, etc. composition. Yeah. And <clears throat> That's when they started to fall behind because they, they didn't pick up the Raider as quickly. They didn't adjust to the meta as quickly. And then that's how we ended up overtaking them. So I think that's that's like the big difference, again, is literally how what me and Semix were discussing, like the experience, the practice and the like the game knowledge and the game sense is at a higher point. So we can adjust to like metas faster than they can. And also just how well-rounded we are because... I mean, not just me and Setmix, but Crack also plays multiple characters, right? You know, yeah. he plays Berserker, he plays Shaman, JJ. Uh, he started playing Raider as well. Um, so we're, we're in this position where, like, all of our players are so well-rounded. And also Otto, to an extent, you know, because he used to play um, Nabushi Kensei in twos and things like that. And then he's also played Shaman and Shinobi. So he's got experience with multiple different types of characters. So we can, we can adjust to whatever happens to be the meta or the strongest in the meta. Like all of us can play different characters and we can pick it up quickly, which is why I feel as though those two particular teams were at the top and why we overtook Hotspot. Okay, so the team synergy also, but it sounds like the, one of the biggest things is their lack of ability to be flexible with their picks and adapt to um, the changes, the changes of the game. Um, yeah, like. I'm sure I'm sure they could do it, but because they haven't already got that experience, it would take them much longer to get to like playing them optimally. Whereas sure. obviously with us, because we already had the experience, we can do it much faster and we can we can adjust to the meta faster and more quickly than pretty much any other team. Okay. Okay. Uh Setmix, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to that point? Uh yes, uh two things actually. Even though they go hand in hand kinda. It's also like a big part of 4v4 is also the communication. Even though we have cluttered VCs at times, I feel like our comms are a lot better than Hotspot's comms. And I feel like we're also, at least in 4v4, we're a lot better at managing tilt. Um, okay. You see, for example, when you see Barracad, right? When he plays against Clutch's Raider, you can tell he gets tilted quite fast. And when Barracad gets tilted, his performance 
it gets a lot worse. And whenever someone from UDDA would get tilted, not only would we try to calm them in VC, but we'd also, we, we would try, despite the, the tilt, to play normally and try to stay focused. And I feel like we have a lot better, we're a lot better at managing tilt than Hotspot is, or was, when the team still existed. So I think that also plays a big part. Mentality, basically. Yeah, mentality. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's that's a pretty common thing in games like this, uh, especially um, like in the Smash in the Smash uh, world or any other fighting game world. You, you hear a lot about how pe- players who are really good can be beaten because of mindset. Mewtwo King is a big example of that in Melee. He is probably one of the best players in the game, but because of his lack of good mentality, he just can get dumpstered by a random, and then he can go and beat you know one of the top players no problem. Um, when he has a good mentality. Um, so uh, uh, last thing I kind of wanted to talk about this was, uh, on this topic was a, a difference of criticism like within the uh, within your guys' team. Um, you talked about comms between, uh, between in UDDA and in Hotspot that you th- believe that the comms were better. Um, does that uh, include like constructive criticism with each other? Because um, obviously there's times where it's the heat of the moment and people are upset that somebody made a, a dumb mistake and uh, that happens. Like I've seen that happen in tournaments before. Um, but how big of a role does constructive criticism play in success of not just UDDA, but in competitive teams in general? Uh, so that makes I'll start I, with you. I feel like it plays a huge role, actually. I feel like if you aren't able to really take constructive criticism, then you don't really belong in a competitive game, in my opinion, because you need criticism to actually improve. It's not possible for you to spot every single mistake that you're making. So it's it's a lot easier for Crack or maybe Clutch to spot a few mistakes here and there that I'm making in my gameplay. And when they tell me, Mixer, do this or that, then it's going to be more optimal. Then that's definitely a, a, a huge help for me as well. So I always appreciate when my teammates actually tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, what is important, though, is the way you communicate your criticism. Yeah. Um, uh, we've had certain arguments, I would say, within the team about how we deliver our criticism, but I feel like we've gotten over it, really. Like, every time after we finish the game, after we've all calmed down a little, after we've all had a few moments of breathing, uh, we usually uh, take it to a really constructive uh manner and we all communicate our criticism quite normally and i I would say that's really i'm not sure how hotspot did it i i have no like i don't know what they did after the games of course but to me what i think is a big factor for them was that they had a certain language barrier because skeptics english wasn't that great so he could i mean he could communicate certain calls of course but i'm not sure to what extent he was able to really understand and provide feedback Mm -hmm. to the teammates so i feel like that also played a role yeah well yeah for sure if you can't communicate in the same language it's it's difficult to get any kind of constructive or otherwise feedback to improve as a team yeah yeah that makes sense uh clutch what about you uh when it comes to uh giving constructive criticism um how has that helped udda and you well i I think one of one of the great things about our team is that um like me, me, Semix both can be like very intense in competitive situations because we're both extremely competitive. Yeah. But no matter like like how tilted we get at one another, like we we never take it personally. Whereas like I've known players as well who like whenever like intensity happens, like they they take it really personally and they also they don't talk up about it. Like they take it very personally and then they'll they'll harbor it and they'll that you know they'll they'll go away they won't they won't talk about it and then it just it inevitably like leads to negativity mm-hmm. whereas with, like with me 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 crack and semix is that we we can talk about it very easily and you know like we're not we're not afraid to be like oh i don't appreciate you like talking to me this way or i'd rather you talk to me about it this way etc and it helps us grow as a team mm-hmm. because if people if people like are just going to like harbor it and like be like, Oh yeah, I don't, I don't like the way he talks to me, but then just don't actually talk to the player they're unhappy with about it. You can't work on it. Right. It, you can't improve on that facet of communication. If you're not being wi- like, if you're not willing to talk to them or want them to change, like how they're being. Um, and I think, I think another very important th- thing to do as well is that you need to, you need to be good enough at the game to, to understand like, 
when like because you, you, you can make mistakes right if you if you play a really good fucking game you're still going to make mistakes yeah but you need to you need to be able to identify like when you've made mistakes and when you've played well to when you've made mistakes and when you played badly right yeah because in, in, especially with like this community like pe- people like love to like you know take the piss out when people make like bad mistakes and stuff but you need to be able to identify like when you've made these mistakes and you you know that you've had like a good game versus like when people have clipped like mistakes and you know you had a bad game and that, that that's also another another very important like skill to have when it comes to improving mm-hmm. is to like you know identifying when yeah you've got a good point like this game played like shit definitely should have done that versus say versus say like you're in a gank with someone and you know you, you let's let's say one guy's throwing out a heavy at you and you're gonna parry it but then the other person like you know quick like quickly throws out a light bashes you and you're not expecting it and then you end up getting jumanji when you could have stalled for longer like th- things like this uh, yeah, you might make the argument that yeah, it's, it's it's a mistake to get blown up so quickly. But at the end of the day, like the, the those kind of things, it's like they're more understandable. Let, 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 let's let's say like, I was playing in the mid lane. You know, this happened to me once, but I was at, like say top of the scoreboard. You know, I had mid for like ninety percent of the game. Like you know, we won team fights. We ha- we controlled the map, etc. I can look at that and be like, yeah, that, even though that's a mistake, I still played well, I, and I, I can identify that's not exactly a part of my game I specifically need to work on because it's just something that happened to be like unfortunate and unfortunately happened yeah. versus like let's say I played in mid and let's say I I kept making say like incorrect reads on old Nabushi back when you could make reads like GB Punisher but she could also do things you know like Viper's Retreat or Sidewind to catch your guard break attempts and I kept making wrong reads taking too much damage and I could I could objectively look at that and be like yeah you're right I should have played more passive I would have been able to hold the minion lane better so I think on top of being able to receive constructive criticism you also need to be like humble enough but also confident enough to identify when you've had a good game and the mistakes you've made aren't necessarily something that you definitely need to work on versus when you've had a bad game and the mistakes you make that are something you need to work on i think that's also very important okay yeah so that kind of actually plays into the the next topic i wanted to move on to which was uh, kind of like the mindset you need to have to be a competitive player uh a side note ghost is in my chat and he said uh let me explain to you how hotspot gaming works. If you're not playing correctly, you will know by Barrick. So <laughs> <laughs> apparently that's the comms. Yeah, I mean, that just proves that their comms were clearly inferior in comparison to ours. Well, the, the issue with that is, though, is what happens when Barrick gets tilted and starts playing badly himself. Right, yeah. Because if, if you just have one individual on your team that's calling out all the mistakes, what happens when said individual starts playing really badly and is... That's that. I I feel like that's a big indication of why they used to fall apart a lot, and why they used to play like so badly when they were tilted, and why it was so easy to make them tilt is probably because Barrack is that kind of player where, you know, he's really really good. He understands the game, so like, and he's not afraid to tell someone when they make a mistake. But if he starts to tilt and get really, like starts playing really badly, which has happened, like I, I would say that's probably Barrack's biggest weakness as a player is like how much he tilts and it affects his gameplay. It's not like he tilts and can continue playing really well. Mm-hmm. No, like he makes really big mistakes when he's tilted. And if if he's the one telling everyone on his team <laughs> what mistakes they're making and he starts playing badly, like I can just imagine him like fucking screaming down the microphone and fucking snapping his keyboard in half and it having a really negative effect on the team. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um I mean I've seen I I I feel like I see seen something similar from the old Legion clips. Uh, when he's on uh, comms when he's on a team um, or even the clip that he has with you uh, clutch I don't remember how long ago it was but you guys were talking about it and he wasn't owning up to a mistake that he had made and oh you, you, you mean, left you the mean, BC because he just yeah, wasn't you mean when you mean when we were playing in the 2v2 tournament and he had this uh, amazing strategy with Nabushi to zone twice put himself out of stamina and then the other team would just gank me and kill me immediately and then he was trying to insist it was my fault for not surviving for longer as warlord <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, um, okay, I mean so... that's that's one of the that's one of the reasons I think why Legion was like he he never did well in fours for such a long time was because he he is that kind of player. Like, like yeah, he's he's extremely good. He's definitely a top tier player, but he really struggles to admit when he makes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, then let's move on to competitive mindset. Then um, I feel like as as somebody who is nowhere near close to 
the level of like UDDA or hot or hotspot when they were around. Um, I still feel like the the biggest thing that separates the competitive players from the casual players or people who consider themselves semi-casual players who are trying to get into the competitive community, like myself, for example, is is a mindset change. Um, go Being able to recognize, like Clutch was saying, recognize your own mistakes, be able to take constructive criticism well, um, I feel like is kind of the paramount or the the key the key things to having a, a good a good mindset to be a competitive player um is is this something that a lot of a, a big reason that casual players or players who are trying to be competitive don't really do well is because they lack that uh that competitive mindset uh clutch you can start if you'd like <clears throat> Wait, did we lose clutch? Uh, oh, he's he's here. Oh. yeah. Like one of the like one of the big things I think that um really separates not just casual players from comp, but separates out like either non-successful comp players or inconsistent comp players is the ability to deal with like intense situations and also to deal with like intense individuals as well because at the, like at the end of the day like top top competitive players you're always going to get a lot of top comp players who are very intense you know who get very heated in um like comp situations because mm -hmm. it's just it's how fucking adrenaline works and i think people who can't like handle like intense situations they either get very nervous they get very timid they or it's like how i, I was saying before right about players whom um kind of shy away like that they, they'll harbor negativity towards a teammate for you know like how they speak or for like not being more constructive with how they talk but they won't talk about it mm -hmm. it's kind of the kind of the same it's kind of the same thing right i think people some people just hate like you know confrontation and like conflict yeah. And people, people always they say, you know, like, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you know, getting intense in team games. You need to stay like constructive, and you need to, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing that. And like, I kind of disagree with this because, I mean, yeah, you shouldn't be sat there calling your like teammates fucking like idiots and they suck dick and shit like this. Sure. But it's it, you also need to be able to handle it when your teammates do get heated. And like let 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 let's say there's a big difference between let let's say you're you're in a gank right and let's say, let's say it's you like say it's me and say like a shaman who's ganking and it's someone else let's let's say the the shaman fucks up the gank right let's let's say let's say she she does her bleed like too late say like three times in a row off of GBs and keeps getting externally blocked like there's a big difference there between me being like oh you're such a fucking idiot you're so fucking bad at this game you like versus me being like oh you really fucked that up you need to you need to like bleed earlier and actually land it mm -hmm. like i'll like i'll do the second like pretty much all the time when i give feedback like i'll be quite intense about it and yes i will be pissed off if my teammate fucks something up but i'll be giving constructive feedback yeah. whereas the first one it's like intense but it's also quite toxic because mm -hmm. it's not constructive and i think people naturally like feel bad or get timid that like with, with either of those forms of feedback and i personally think to like to really excel at like a really high level you have to you have to be confident enough to to handle that intensity to not take it personally to to take it on and you also have to be you have to be able to like take that kind of feedback from teammates as well like like setmix has done it with me before where like i'll fuck something up and he's gotten pissed off with me and like yeah i, I might get like annoyed but I take it on board. I don't take it personally, and I don't let it affect how I play. And I think that's a that's a, that's a, like a very important thing. It's it, well, it, it, there's actually a very relatable story from way way back when I started playing Dominion in this game, like with Dominion teams, mm -hmm. and I used to be part of the um, like it was it was me, Toysus. Yarl and someone else and it was back when uh, what was what was that discord called way back in the day that had like all the top like comp players in and um fucking oh who was it who was in charge of it Fuck, what was his name oh, i can't remember his fucking name he was friends with pete moo and he was he was on one of the early like land tournaments he was quite short what was his fucking name can't remember i'm not sure
either of you? you? You remember Durandal? Oh, I remember Durandal, yeah. Durandal Craft? Yes. And he used to run that one Discord that had, like, all the comp players in it. And I remember he had, like, their main team, right, which was him, Pete, Moo, Exteleon, and someone else. And he, like... He played in the tour. It was, I think it was him and Pete Moo played with me and Toysis one tournament. And obviously, me and Toysis used to be very similar, right? We were both really intense, whereas Pete Moo and Durandal used to be a lot more like laid back and shit. And we we lost one tournament in the finals, I think, a Dominion tournament. And I can remember him talking talking to us after the tournament was just like, yeah, like I think you guys need to like work on your like communication and shit, and blah 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 blah. And I said to him, I was just like, I was like, look, dude, I've had success in multiple tournaments and multiple competitive games i've been like team captain of like teams that have been the absolute best in a couple of games before and i was just like this is just how i've always been and i've always had the most successful teams with individuals that were that got really intense but could also handle it so like he stuck like me and toysis on like their their like b team pretty much and it was like me toysis Yarl, and i think hanzax and they ended up having it was like it was like Durandal, Pete Moo, Exteleon, and there was one other guy. I can't remember who it was. But um basically we had two different philosophies about how the team would run. And um in the very next tournament we played in, we actually ended up they ended up getting knocked out, I think in like the semifinals or some shit. And we actually ended up winning the tournament. And then after that tournament we subbed in um, we subbed Toysis out because he stopped playing the game and we had Aller in the team and then we won that one as well when we beat Stormblast tw- uh, no wait it wasn't twice because that was before Double Elimination was in but we beat uh, we beat Stormblast in the very first round and then we beat Ice Guy's team in the finals The it was I think it was Ice Guy's Cypher, Kinsey and King Richard and um, I think that kind of goes to show like what I'm on about like the most successful teams are going to be able to handle that intensity and like I can understand people wanting to keep like a calm environment in comp games, but I think it's very overrated to to keep intensity in check and to keep like a calm environment because I believe that to succeed at the highest level you should be able to thrive in intense environments because at the end of the day, like that's what pressure situations are, are very intense environments. And if you can't handle like an intense environment with your team you're not going to be able to handle intense environments in competitions. And I feel like that's always, that's why I've always been very successful, even though a lot of people have said that like I'm very hard to play with because I'm intense. I've also had the most success out of literally every single person that's ever complained about how intense I am. So I, f- I feel as though I have like the experience and the proof of my philosophy for how I like to play and the people that I like to play with. And that's also why I think that our team now is really, really good because me, Crack, and Semix, obviously I'm not sure about Otto because I haven't I haven't played with Otto before and he's always seemed like a laid-back person. But me, Crack, and Semix can handle intensity very well. We don't take things personally. And we, that's why we thrive in these situations. Yeah. And and there's there's a, a, a definite difference between uh, being intense and being toxic that you laid out. And there's nothing saying that uh, you can't give constructive criticism while being intense. I mean, if you're you're passionate about a game and passionate about what you're doing and you want to win, I mean, you can you can do that in a respectful way <clears throat> and still uh, lift up your and, and improve your teammates. Uh, because if if you're just toxic to them, you're nobody's going to want to play with you. Um, I've played with uh, Ad- Adamiac once in two v two scrims, and I never want to do it again. <laughs> um i'm not surprised uh, me too, dude. <laughs> i mean it's it's not like the criticism that he was giving me was wrong he was calling out a lot of stuff that i was doing wrong and i learned a lot um he just didn't do it in the, in the correct way and and maybe if i if i you know owned up a little bit i probably could do it it probably would be good for me if he wanted to team with me for scrims or whatever but yeah it wasn't it just wasn't the the greatest uh experience um so, uh, Setmix, did you have uh, anything else that you, that you wanted to add about uh, competitive a competitive mindset between, uh, like the the casual to semi casual and the competitive players? Mm, yeah, I feel like oftentimes I have people ask me um, what they gotta do to be a competitive player and all, and I'm like, well, you gotta practice, and then they're like, well. I can't really practice because I work from nine to five. And I'm like, yeah, so what? I feel like people 
overestimate how much time you actually have to spend playing For Honor to actually become good at the game. Because, I don't know, I work from, usually I work from 7 to 7, so 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And I still manage to get enough practice in per day to remain this this level of gameplay that I have. And back when I when Clutch picked me up for UDA, I was I had the same shifts. I worked 12 hours per day and still had enough time to improve in the game. So I feel like unless you work on weekends, I don't know if it, how it is if you work on weekends because tournaments are usually on weekends, but as long as you at least take I don't know 10 to 30 minutes per day to just practice something, try to obtain some knowledge about something, whatever, as long as you take a little bit of time per day, you will definitely improve and you definitely have the chance to actually become a competitive top player. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of transitions into, into scrims too. Uh, uh, the practicing seems to be the biggest, um, the biggest thing, but I know at least from, from myself personally, and maybe other people who are watching can attest to this is knowing exactly what to practice. Um, when I was in my undergrad at, uh, the, when I lived in a different state, uh, I had a, uh, professor, uh, who was teaching me marimba, uh, percussion. And he had told me that the, the phrase practice makes perfect is a garbage phrase because it doesn't really tell you what exactly you need to do. Um, he said the phrase should be perfect practice makes perfect because if you know, if you're practicing the thing correctly, whatever it is, then you will increase in the skill you know, of whatever you're practicing. And that kind of seems relevant here is if you can go into MM and you can try and practice like, okay, I'm going to play Zerker. I'm going to practice trying to gank off of a, a random who is on my team or something like that. But it seems like knowing what to practice is going to be more beneficial than just, just jumping in and just playing. Um, so what is uh, so what is the the best uh, the best way to practice? Is it scrims? Is it four v four matchmaking? Um, does that not really matter? Is it more of what you do in those games that are more beneficial? Uh, Set mix. We can start with you. Um, I feel like every single match that you play has something that you can learn from, even if it's matchmaking. Like I started off learning peacekeeper by playing matchmaking. Mm -hmm. So, um, you can, like, for example, in, in matchmaking, you can always kind of put yourself in a situation where you get ganked. So, there's definitely a way to practice getting ganked, so anti-ganking. There's ways to practice rotations as well, even though they're kind of screwed by your teammates. But you can still kind of see where you have to rotate in order to help out your teammates. So, I feel like the important part is to always kind of figure out what happened during a game. And what should have happened during a game? You can compare like you, what do you, what do you, the, the biggest thing that I recommend every single person is record your gameplay, record your gameplay and watch it back because during the game, during the heat of the battle, you won't always see all the mistakes and all the things that happen during a Dominion game. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually watch back the entire thing, you might spot a few more things that you didn't notice during the game, and that will definitely help you improve. And the good thing about it is as well that you can compare. Not only your games that you had, and you can see the visual improvements that you have made, but you can also compare your gameplay, for example, to my gameplay or to Clutcher's gameplay, and then definitely see, okay, UDDA rotated in other ways than my team did, so maybe we should consider uh, rotating with a different character to a different point, and, and so on. Like, there's definitely uh, a lot of things that you can do, not only in matchmaking, but also in scrims, also in tournaments, and I feel like... A lot of people um, have a misconception of how you are supposed to play in tournaments. Because people are always like, well, if I play in a tournament, I might as well try to win. Which isn't wrong, but tournaments are a playground for people that seek growth. In the f that's, that's their main objective. They seek growth. So if you enter a tournament with the idea of getting practice, you will have a lot more benefits out of joining a tournament than you would have if you join a tournament for winning so i feel like people should you know try not to be too intimidated by the competition not try to be too intimidated by how tournaments work and just perceive it as a way to improve in the game because it's definitely the best place to actually get practice 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And and that kind of speaks to like what you were saying speaks to the competitive mindset too. Like when people enter tournaments and they have the proper mindset, like these people are learning to grow. They're they're or they're wanting to grow and they're they're wanting to just improve as a player and improve as a team. Uh, I kind of I kind of said this in my last podcast when we were talking about the steel tournaments and how, uh, in my opinion, competitive players aren't always after the prize pool in the in the tournament that they're playing. Obviously, it can be a motivating uh, factor, but the mo- the main motivating factor should be uh, improving as a player, improving as a team, uh, seeing how other people play, adapt, etc. Um, uh, Clutch, did you uh, did you want to say? Or have anything else to say about like how to properly practice? <clears throat> um, I mean, obviously, what Semix was saying um, <clears throat> about entering a tournament always to win it. Like, it's it's like I said, advertised tournaments on my stream that uh, playing in tournaments is like the best way to to learn how the game is played and to to improve your gameplay. But I think. Also, as Setmix was saying about, well, sorry, you were saying about perfect practice makes perfect. It's def- you definitely need to know what to practice because if you if like if you're practicing the wrong thing, like that, that, I don't know. Let's let's say you're you're learning how to gank and you you're practicing for some reason. I don't know, like Valkyrie Aramusha, and like you're you're practicing the Aramusha just heavy ch- infinite chaining to lock them down for like the the shield crush mm-hmm. like that's that's not going to be optimal because you're just going to feed revenge it's going to take fucking forever to kill someone and then you're going to get so used to ganking that way that it's gonna you're gonna have that muscle memory inbuilt and then it's just going to be more awkward to try and learn how to gank properly so what i would recommend like for optimal practice is learning exactly what you should be doing you know like if you want to practice ganking you learn you find out which characters are good at ganking and once you found out which characters are ganking uh, go to ganking then you learn how exactly they're supposed to gank and then you practice that same thing with like say anti-ganking you know you, you learn what makes certain characters good at anti ganking you look at jj it's a combination of learning distancing so, so you're not as vulnerable to guard breaks and utilizing your like you know side dodge heavies for iframes etc and then if you're up against a comp that relies on guard breaks because i'll pretty much all of the good uh, gankers rely on guard break setups, you know, like Berserker guard break into zone, Shaolin guard break into delay triple light, uh, Lawbringer guard break into impale, etc. Like Shaman guard break into bleed. Yep. L- like with JJ, you you have to make good reads. You have to understand that they want mm-hmm. gank setups. You have to judge the distance, like judge their movement. You know, look how they're moving. See if they they've got like a, a telegraph for when they're going to guard break you, and then you know zoning. To make them eat 25 damage because that's 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 a lot of damage for a zone like for example nabushi only does 24 when she's locked onto someone that's bleeding and it's 20 whereas his zone is like the same speed they yeah, had the hitbox and forward tracking isn't as good mm-hmm. but it, it's quite a bit more damage and again that's like another reason why jj is good but you have to understand that right if you're just mashing fucking zone attack for no reason you're literally just going to be wasting your stamina because um jj doesn't have a shitload of stamina to play around with obviously he can regen it but his shifu stance is very risky to use in a gank situation because you are guard break vulnerable during it so it's like you you have to understand like when you want to use his zone when it's okay to use up a lot of his stamina using the zone and it's when you're making reads for guard break setups so you have to understand exactly what you're practicing and why you're practicing it and the optimal way to play and once you understand like what you're doing and what the optimal way to play is, then you should be practicing these things to to get it like ingrained into into your muscle memory, etc. Okay. <clears throat> um, so another question then I would have is uh, we were talking about exactly how that you can play in matchmaking, um, in tournaments, uh, being able to basically do homework to know. Like depending on what character you're playing, how to gank with them, or if you're the person who needs to be doing like the guard breaking or like whatever the situation may be, uh, I'm curious as to the effect that the people that you would like scrim with, um, if that makes difference. Uh, I know that there are times where um, people four v four scrims will be called for and for glory, um, and then the meme is no white names. Um, so because the the type of practice that you're wanting to get is not necessarily going to be beneficial for you or for the people who are below your skill level. Um, so that kind of uh, suggests to me that the people who you do scrim with matter. 
Um, but is that is that something that you you guys would consider to be true as well? Like, should you be scrimming with people who are at your same skill level? Should you be scrimming with people who are just slightly better than you? Um, like, how like what would be the most beneficial for people trying to improve in a scrim setting? Uh, set mix, you can go ahead. Um, I feel like the thing is, if you reach a certain skill level. Like, let's say you reach a skill level of clutch or my skill level. Then it is going to matter who you scrim with and who you scrim against. Because usually you want to practice very specific things in a game setting. And when you play with people who aren't that knowledgeable, who aren't on your skill level quite yet, they don't usually play in like the ways you need them to play in order to practice these things. So in our cases, it actually mattered a lot who we scrimmed with. It's probably why a lot of people don't play in pickup scrims. For example, Vinx completely refused to play in pickup scrims because they weren't beneficial for his gameplay. Right. Because as a lawbringer, you needed teammates who do specific things for the character to work. So that matters. But if, you, if you're if you like below that skill level, it, it really takes a long way till you're on that skill level. Um, it, re it doesn't really matter who you scrim with because there's so many things you can improve on, so many things you can optimize that pretty much every, like I said earlier, every single match you play, there's always something to learn from it, every single time. So I feel like if you aren't in the top 0.01%, you should definitely take every scrim opportunity you get and analyze every single uh, piece of gameplay, gameplay that you have. Um, a thing I want to add to this is also, um, if you get practice, it can be difficult for people to figure out what they exactly want to practice or need to practice to improve their gameplay. Um, for Honor, though, it's pretty easy to reach out to top players and ask them for feedback. Yeah. But what I want to say to this is, if you ask a top player for feedback, don't be vague. Be very specific. Because if you're vague and go into their, in their DMs or go to For Glory and be like, how do I play, I don't know, Warden in Dominion? You're not going to get an answer because that's such a wide topic, such a wide question. Like, there's so many Good things question. we could tell you about it. The, the <laughs> amount of times I have people coming into my chat and they're like, yo, bro, I'm a rep 6 BP. Any tips? And I'm just like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's such a broad like right. question that I literally yeah. can't do any good advice based off of that. Yeah. It's way too vague. Like, if, the, if a question is that vague, our replies are going to be equal in vagueness because... We could, like, if someone asks us, what can you do with Black Pryor? We could talk uh, an entire podcast full about how Black Pryor works and what he can do and what he can't do. Yeah. So, like, if you reach out to a top player, be as specific as possible. Mention what you struggle with. Mention the situations you find yourself get caught in. Like, be as, just be as specific as possible. That's really... Like, if you do that, it's very likely that you get actual good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So making proper use of the time of the person that you're asking. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I can, I can attest to this cause I've asked, uh, I've asked set mix for feedback on the tournaments that I've played. Um, I've been vague and I've been um, uh, precise and, and I, and I've gotten advice that was both vague and precise. Um, I've gotten cloach, uh, cloaching, yikes, coaching <laughs> from clutch, sorry, um, about uh, warden. Um, and how to play him, and um, I got a lot of a lot of great advice because we went over very specific things. Um, so I think having a good idea, if you are going to do that, having a good idea of what you struggle with um, and what you want to know, even if you even if you truly do want to know what can I do with this character, I'm rep six to use Clutch's example. I don't know what I'm doing. I want to know everything. Um, that's fine, but you're not going to find out everything all in one setting just know just pick something pick a few things to get advice on to improve <clears throat> because it, in set mix has told me this in our when i've asked him for um for feedback is to pick certain things that you want to improve on or certain things you need to improve on and work on them instead of working on everything all at once because it's more difficult to do that but it's easier to focus on one or two things at a time and improve those and then move on um yeah. so uh clutch did you have um or not in, uh, anything else anything else to add before i move on to another question with that 
stop coming into my fucking stream and asking me for fucking tips. Like, with no <laughs> specific. It gets fucking so tilting. <laughs> Don't ask him any questions. Yo, yo, he doesn't yo, like yo, questions. Yo, yo, clutch up. I, I'm playing PK and I'm rep 7. Like, <laughs> I, any tips, dude? I, like, any, any tips on how, how, how I can become um, Master Anti Ganker in one hour, dude? Like, no. That's really not. I can't give you any answers. Please stop asking me. <laughs> like I, I literally had one guy coming into the stream recently. He was just like, "Yo, uh, like I've just picked up Shaolin. Like I've got like three reps on him. How can I play him?" And I'm just like, "It's way too broad." And he's just like, "I just want some basic tips on how to play Shaolin." But and I'm still like, "Dude, I can't give you any advice." He's just like, "I just want to learn how to play Shaolin." I'm just like, yeah, it's, it's also like. Stop! I feel like... <laughs> It's right. quite difficult for us sometimes to get into the mindset of a player that isn't on our skill level because sometimes they do mistakes that we ca we just can't foresee those mistakes. Sure. It's impossible. <laughs> it's not doable. So like, be precise because we can't read your mind. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think this there's this this infuriating misconce misconception with the competitive community that um that they don't that they're just toxic towards casual players and that they don't like casual players or that they're elitist or whatever. Uh, Clutch has been accused of gatekeeping the competitive community. Um, and it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because I mean, you're hearing Man's like the two game. best, the, arguably the two best players in the video game talking about how, if you come to us with specific um, questions, specific um, situations that we will, be happy to help you but if you're broad then we uh, with your inquiries we can't necessarily give you everything that you're wanting to to hear it and and to me that doesn't sound like any sound like gatekeeping it doesn't sound like somebody pe a community that wants to keep people out who hate the casual community these are people who want to help but if people don't know how to ask for that help then it becomes it becomes difficult on both sides because one person's frustrated because they want advice from the best players in the game and the best players in the game are frustrated because they can't give just general advice they need well, specifics there is some like I'd, like i feel like the whole comp community being toxic right i mean yeah that like there are certain people that are just toxic for yeah. no reason but the whole oh toxic like all comp players are toxic probably originate from the fact that people get fucking tired of people spouting bullshit essentially like people who know how the game works get tired of people who don't know how the game works saying falsehoods about the game and then not accepting when they're wrong right for example if someone says to me oh it's way too easy to anti-gank in this game here's a clip of me ganking and like it's someone playing some character that can't gank but is with somebody that has a character that can gank for example let's say a berserker mm -hmm. and instead of seeing the valkyrie you know guard break into zerk zone into like heavy or whatever i literally see this valkyrie dash lining of them externally i see them trying to shield crush them for no reason <clears throat> yeah and i tell them be like anti-ganking isn't too easy in this game in fact if if let's say even if you're playing a character like say i'm playing jj i've got full health I'm going up against, say, a Black Prior and a Berserker, and they're both at full health. I'm going to be unfavored in that situation. And if they play it correctly, they should kill me every single time. I might be able to just drag it out. You know, I might be able to deal a decent amount of damage to them, but they're all, they're always going to be favored because as long as you're playing with a gank, I mean, even if you're not playing with a gank character, even if you're playing with someone that's got like a kind of a shitty gank that feeds a lot of revenge, let's say a Rogue GPK and the PK GBs for delayed top, double top light into a heavy. Mm hmm. Yeah, they're going to get revenge. You're not going to be able to kill them before they get revenge. But you can still at least deal quite a bit of damage. You're going to deal, like, what, 40 damage, 50 damage off of that, which is still a sizable amount of damage. But if this if this individual who's, like, saying, like, oh, it's it's way too easy to do this specific act, like, it, to, to anti-gank, you know, like, we need changes to ganking or whatever. And then I say to them, be like, actually, no, you're, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. With this specific character, you're supposed to be guard breaking for the Zerg zone setup because that's how you guarantee the most amount of damage for the least amount of revenge gain. And then this individual starts getting, you know, like either upset or starts, you know, being childish or starts being like non-constructive with their feedback and starts right. like, let, let's let's say they say something dumb, right? And be like, oh, if it's if it's if it's not easy to anti-gank in this game, then I, I look forward to seeing you ganking everybody with uh, PK Orochi. Then, <laughs> yeah, like 
you're going to you're going to get some toxic behavior towards you or you're going to be called an idiot because at the end of the day like you've been given a constructive answer you've been told your flaws and you need to be mature enough or you need to be like you need to you need to be able to accept like okay may, maybe you have a point you know like they they need to accept that they don't have as much knowledge about the game as the individual is talking to them Mm-hmm. And they, they need to be able to admit that they're wrong and be able to accept it, right? And I, I feel like some people just can't accept when they're wrong. So instead of, instead of you know, taking it on the chin and being like, yeah, you're right. I, I didn't think about that. I'll, I'll work on it. Thank you very much for the advice. They can't accept that they're wrong. They get defensive. And then competitive players, in return, will be like, well, I've literally just told you what you need to do. You're trying to argue with someone that has far more greater knowledge base than you. And then this individual gets upset and then goes and says shit like, oh, yeah, I always knew the comic community was toxic, blah, 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 blah. Right. Like, I mean, of course, right. like, <clears throat> you think you think if I go and walk into, let's say I go, I walk into, like, say, my university in my city, right? And I know that the, the head of programming there, or at least I, I don't know who it is right now, but it used to be someone who was extremely skilled with programming, right? He had, he had like, a PhD in physics he had like a phd in like computer science he'd worked for like nasa john deere like he'd worked for Sick. so many like amazing companies and he was fucking amazing the programmer right and it would be like me walking in and being like yo dude like fucking it's so much easier just to throw all of your code into a single file because you don't have to keep on like making sure the f- files are linked up and calling references to all the different classes and blah 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 like he's he's just gonna laugh at me and be like all right dude like and it would literally be like me walking around and be like, oh, I just went into the university to tell this guy who's got a PhD in computer science how to program correctly. And he was just so toxic to me, bro. He like laughed at me. Like, I mean, yeah, of course he's going to laugh at me because I'm saying something really stupid. I'm trying to argue with someone that probably has like 20, 30, 40,000 hours in this profession and is extremely good in his field. And I'm trying to argue with him about it when I've literally only got like a fucking bachelor's d- degree in fucking programming. And I'm telling him something that everyone knows is... Uh, anyone who knows what they're talking about is stupid yeah. like i feel like that's where a lot of the whole oh, comp- competitive players are toxic comes from because you know long story short people say something that isn't true they get corrected they get defensive and then you know the, the competitive players in turn tell them that they're wrong and that they're acting stupid and they take it personally and then it just all snowballs snowballs from there that, like that's literally where it comes from mm-hmm. yeah and this person starts a twitter war and everything yeah it's not even twitter just like you know they they go into a Twitch chat, talk about it. They go onto Reddit, they talk about it. They talk about their group of friends, and then their group of friends talk with their other friends, and then it all spreads like that. That's literally how it all originates. Like I said, some people can just be genuinely toxic in the comp community, but that's not exclusive to the comp community. There, there are extremely toxic people in any community, but the the whole rumor originates from shit. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating to... It's frustrating for me because as somebody who I've not been part of the competitive community very long, um, and, but I constantly hear this this rhetoric of, of like the comp community is toxic, like Clutch is the CEO of the comp community and he's toxic, therefore everybody in the community is toxic and whatever Clutchmeister says is is the end all be all of the of how people feel about X player in the in the community and it's 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 kind of frustrating because I'm I'm part of that community and i see the people who make a difference in this game who put the time into it because they're passionate about it despite its myriad of flaws and they're not anything like what's described um i mean there's there's banter in for glory there's some genuine toxicity sometimes depending on who you're talking to um but overall when it comes to the health, when it comes to the game and improving players and improving the game in general it's just not really it's not really a claim that you can really have with any kind of logical coherency like you can you can look at these people and say yeah maybe they get tilted but they like this game they're passionate about this game and they want people to improve at it so this this uh presupposition is just wrong and it, it, it just bother, it bothers me a lot it's why i don't go on reddit and the competitive subreddit or the regular reddit anymore because it's it's all you it's all you see um and it's just very frustrating uh, so why this isn't a question that I had originally posed to you guys, but I wanted to know wanted to know why it is that people lack this this mindset of being able to take this this constructive criticism. Like why do people have to get defensive when it comes to being told that they're wrong or being told that 
an idea that they have isn't isn't good like why is this the case why why can't people why is there a a, a, a reason for a, a a lack of i can't think of the right word um a, a desire to to improve and to be wrong because noticing that being wrong means it's something that you can improve on because you're not perfect at everything but feedback helps you become better. So why is there this lack of, of mindset, not just in the competitive, in, in like in a competitive setting, but like in the game in general? Uh, hmm. Either one of you. I'll, I, doesn't matter. I'll let, let Setmix go first because I went on a bit of a rant with the last one. <laughs> um, sure. I don't know. It's a difficult question. Um, I, I feel like... Not everyone is like that. There is a lot of people that are pretty receptive to criticism, but there's also a lot of people that get very defensive, as Clutch said. Um, why do people do that? I would assume... I can't actually tell why it's like that. I just make assumptions here. I assume it's because of their ego, probably. Because they probably have, like... Everyone perceives themselves as something. And they probably perceive themselves as, I don't know, probably a good player or something, or a player that is above average and whenever you correct them or tell them no this or that idea isn't that great their ego gets hurt a little bit that, that's my assumption i don't know if it's actually the truth but that's what i would assume is the case um obviously i can't make an educated uh can't give you an educated opinion here on that matter because i don't know i'm i'm not that great when it comes to psychology so yeah okay <clears throat> uh clutch i mean i 100 percent think it's an ego thing like to to get upset like and try to argue with someone that has a lit like literally has a proven knowledge base that is far greater than yours it's literally an ego issue like you can't l accept that you are wrong so therefore you get defensive like that's literally all it is like it, it's kind of why i also think that like online communities in general like you know there's a lot of like toxicity or whatever because at the end of the day i think like there are a lot of um like gaming is a medium that like obviously will attract like a lot of um like introverts and stuff like people who nest who aren't necessarily that confident mm -hmm. and i think a lot like a lot of people who get like let's let's say they get to a point in the game right where they they, they win quite a bit of their games you know they become like okay at the game they're, they're far far from like a top level but you know they actually win their games they, they feel good about themselves you know because they're actually doing something quite well and let's say they they form like an opinion on something and they actually you know have some confidence about like their ability in the game even if it's like misguided and then someone who is far better at the game for them, far more knowledgeable tells them that this is wrong. They can't, because they're naturally not a very confident person, but they had a little bit of confidence about the game. Someone questioning like their knowledge base about this is going to, to hurt them, right? Because that the one thing that they actually have a little bit of confidence in is being proven to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. So this is going to have an effect on them. And if they're not a very confident person, they're going to they're gonna get defensive about it, right? And I, f I feel like that's why there, ha there seems to be so much of this in games specifically. Because it's not just for Honor, right? There, there are other games where people just think that pro players are wrong about something, even though they have absolutely no nowhere near like the knowledge base that this individual has. Mm -hmm. Versus like, you see, like for example, let's 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 say I don't know. Let's say Ronaldo or Messi say something about football or whoever, like I say, a top player in the NFL is, says something like, say, like a top level quarterback says something about how to be a, a good quarterback. You're not going to get some, some like 14 year old kid who plays in the fucking, in the ghettos with his mates, like who plays football, be like, nah, mate, like I know how to play like a quarterback better than you. You just don't know what you're talking about. Like that's not going to happen. Whereas it does in games a lot more often. And I, I think it's, a, it's just something to do with that. It's literally just people don't have the confidence to be able to accept that they're wrong about something and <clears throat> not get really upset about it because at the end of the day accepting that you're wrong and not like getting upset about it that is also a form of confidence because you have to be confident enough in yourself to admit you're wrong without it basically affecting your self-worth because people who get really upset when they're proven wrong it's typically an issue of self-worth right you know they feel as though that like their knowledge or their worth has been somewhat diminished because someone of a higher status than them is you know saying that they're wrong mm -hmm. so they get defensive about it in order to try and save just to save their ego 
and that's basically back to what I said is, yeah, I think that mix is 100% correct. He, he, he's not, he's not going to say it with any certainty, but I'm very confident to say that, it, yes, it is very much an ego thing. Okay. Yeah. And I, I agree with that as well. And this is actually something that I personally struggle with when I'm in playing in matchmaking and I know I'm playing poorly or I'm playing against players who I know that I, I've played against previously and I know that I can beat and that I can do better than what I'm, uh, than what I'm doing. And when I make, when I make mistakes um, and everything like that, I tend to beat myself up because I'm not very confident in, in my ability to play the game correctly. And it til- it, I get tilted at the mistakes that I make and then I start blaming other things that aren't whose fault it is. Like if I miss a parry or something because I was trying to option select zone and instead I do a heavy. Like that's – I may have in- done the input, but if I didn't do it correctly, then obviously it's the game's not going to do it. And that's and that's on me. But I have, a, I have an issue with losing to people that I should be – that I know I can win because I – bring it back to this is bring it back to I can do this but I'm not because I'm a bad player um so I know for for me it's a, a my mindset is not where it needs to be um and I feel like this could be the case as well for uh, other uh casual players and or other people who are trying to get into the competitive scene um so how how does somebody or how would somebody uh like me for example or other people who have ascertain that the, that their mindset is a, is a is the problem like how we've talked about practicing how to play the game talked about who you practice with what you do in the game is important but how do you practice having a, a proper mindset um like if you're in, in matchmaking you're not necessarily going to get constructive feedback from your teammates you might um but usually broadly that's not the case so you're kind of on your own uh how how would you guys uh, practice having good mindset or training your mindset when it comes to not necessarily just taking advice, but uh, playing the game properly and not getting upset when you do something wrong. Um, who wants to start? Uh, you can go for it, Sammy. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. Um, I know certain people that have like kind of like small rituals for themselves to practice their mindsets. Mm-hmm. Um, I know a guy who used to get tilted really badly at whatever, like he got tilted at everything, dude. Um, um, after a while, he discovered that when he has a notepad open on his second monitor that says, don't get tilted, whenever he gets tilted, he just looks at the notepad, sees, don't get tilted, and that's it. Tilt is gone. And that's how he fixes his mindset. Like, you just have to find something for yourself to really remind yourself that you shouldn't have a certain way of thinking. Let it be a notepad, let it be a certain song that you play in the background, whatever works for you, but you got to figure out something for yourself, I think. It's really something that depends on each individual. Okay, <clears throat> sure. Uh, clutch? Um, I mean, when it comes to, to, like, if you're talking about, like, how to stop yourself from tilting, like, Honestly, it, it, it's literally just, it just becomes a process of getting into the habit of not tilting. Like literally every single time that you, um, that you, uh, like you start to tilt or, you know, you can get angry. It's, it, it's kind of things like swear jars, right? It's some, it's something, if you can find something like negative to, to happen. So it's like, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's like reinforcement, right? Through yeah. like a negative means. So let's, let's say, you, you know, whenever you swear, you put some money into a jar eventually you're, you're you're going to start associating this this like reaction right with negativity so it's 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 eventually going to start happening so like for example for example one thing that my brother used to do whenever like i would swear or something he would just fuck it he would just punch me in the arm like hard and eventually I'd, i would like stop doing it so if if you could think of something like bad i don't know for example let's say I'm, try- I'm trying to think of some like it's it's kind of hard because I don't exactly have any like guilty pleasures I could like starve myself from it. I don't know. Like, right. let's, let's say you're fucking addicted to chocolate, <laughs> and you just literally <laughs> just you, you you don't allow yourself to have like a fucking bar of chocolate or some shit if you tilt for no reason like for that day, or you have someone take the fucking bar of chocolate away from you. Let's say you got like a girlfriend or a friend, or you, like say you got like a roommate. That could be a way of doing it, but um, for me, it's just. 
I, like I just tell myself just not to fucking like when, I like I identify like I, I can quite easily tell you know when I'm tilted but it's like a constructive like I can be constructive about it versus I'm tilted and it's non-constructive or it's like destructive mm -hmm. so I don't have to do something like that but um but like if if I was if I had to give advice to someone like oh I just I fucking lose my shit and like for the stupidest reasons I would recommend doing something like that like some kind of reinforcement it doesn't work for everyone but it, it's something to do yeah and if we're talking about mentality in terms of let's say you feel really uncomfortable um, about something and how how do I feel more comfortable about something then you literally just make yourself do whatever is uncomfortable and the more you do it the more comfortable you will get. Like one hundred percent. Like you just have to force yourself to do it. Like there's there's a reason why I never ever, literally never, feel pressure, and I like I never like crumble under pressure. And it's literally because I've been playing like games competitively for probably over ten years now. So I've I've literally been in so many situations like pressure situations that I'm I'm just so used to those kind of things that I just I literally I never get like nervous. I never I never feel under pressure or anything. So, so it's, I mean, it's like fucking Conor McGregor said, right? He was just like, you know, the, the more you seek the uncomfortable, the more comfortable you'll become. And it's it's true. Like, it, it's it's also like people being afraid of what they don't understand, right? Like, they always say, like, people are always afraid of what they don't know or they don't understand. And it's it's literally just a case of you, you want to feel comfortable, then you you just fucking do it. You, the more you do it, the more comfortable you will get. Yes, it's it's not easy when you have to start doing it for the first time. Like, I know it's not easy. Yeah. But there's there's just no other way. You just you just make yourself fucking do it, and the more you do it, and the more frequently you do it. Like if you do it like once every fucking three months, it's not really gonna help because it's it's just gonna be something you dread, like, and it's not gonna help. You have to do it regularly, and you do it often, and I can guarantee you, it will fucking help. Okay, yeah, my uh, what I try to do is I just remember like how. Like there are some streamers who play this game, who play matchmaking or duels or whatever all the time. I just like don't get tilted ever. Like Kitties is a big example of this. I don't know how he plays the game and maintains a a positive attitude all the time with some of the stuff that like that happens just because it For Honor has its has its things. Um, and I try that, and that's something that I'm striving to try and have is. You know, no matter what's happening in the game, is keeping a positive, a positive attitude or a, a, a introspective attitude as to what I'm doing, uh, because it also helps. Like if you're streaming too, like nobody necessarily wants to to watch somebody who rages 24 seven every time they play the video game. Like it's, it's. I would, I would debate that. I think a lot of people find that shit entertaining. <laughs> I, I I mean I do agree with that, but I think I think people find entertaining the more. It, it, like the the type of rage it is, I guess. Like you can have fa you can have faux rage. You can I mean, have legitimate uh, like, rage. A, a prime example of this is fucking some smash, dude. How how entertaining did people find it when Summit fucking punched his webcam? Like they fucking <laughs> love it. There's even a, a gif emote of it. Like people love to see people fucking rage like to ridiculous degrees. Like who who's another example? Like XQC doesn't he like fucking get extremely tilted? Tyler one two. Yeah, Tyler one two. The but... one's a fucking perfect example of it. Like, <laughs> people right. love to watch people losing their fucking shit. Like, it's entertaining. <laughs> oh, did we lose? Yep. It? I mean, there's there's a uh, difference. There there's a different. There's, there's like an edge, right? There's there's a difference between like tilting, right, and getting really angry, which is entertaining. Yeah, and being a negative Nancy, I I think right. you're like confusing the two. Like being a negative Nancy, like if I was to say if I was to sit on stream right, and I was just like, yeah, this game's fucking shit, dude. I fucking hate this game. Yes, yeah, if I don't know why anyone plays this, everyone's an idiot, dude. Right? Everyone fucking hate keeps <laughs> this community, dude. Like fucking idiots like Clutch Minds to do join this fucking dope community, dude. I right? Like this fuck, why, 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 why can the Bushi zone me from like five meters away, dude? Like, hate this game. Like, yeah, people would get sick of that if that if that was literally the entire stream. Yeah. Whereas if I'm sat here like <laughs> punching my fucking table, like, what a fucking load of bullshit! <laughs> people are gonna click that and they're gonna find it entertaining. Like, I think that, I think that's the difference between the two things. Like, yeah, if you're negative, non, people are gonna like they're not gonna find that entertaining. But if the rage and the excessive rage, hundred percent, people like and find. Yeah, and, and yeah. I, I can I can see I can see that argument for sure. I mean, there's also 
uh, how like when in terms of like Tyler one or XQC, like how much of it is actually real and how much of it is they know that the, what their their view audience is after. Like it's the same with Doctor Disrespect. Like he's he's done this persona where he just complains about every single game he plays. It doesn't matter if it's his fault or not. He just complains about it. But the majority of people know when they watch him that this is what the stream is. Like when you click on Twitch Doc TV slash Doctor Disrespect, this it comes baked with the cake. Like this is what this is what you're gonna get. But then, it, but I feel like that can be different from a streamer who is who doesn't who that isn't part of their. Uh, I don't want to say gimmick, but it's basically what they're, what they're offering from the stream, then it, it can be not, off-putting. Not, not the target audience. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we've, uh, we've covered uh, three pretty uh, good topics. Uh, we've talked about competitive mindset, um, how to basically how to train yourself, just put, you, put yourself in these situations where you know you're weak at to just to improve them. Um, we've talked about how to practice, um, how, and how to get better feedback. Um, we've talked about the differences between like the top teams with the UDDA and hotspot and then the casual community. Um, so the last thing I wanted to, that I wanted to ask both of you is, uh, uh, what exactly is keeping you going with this game, playing, playing the game in general, but then playing as at a, at a competitive level. Um, we're starting to see, the competitive scene potentially pick up more with spectator mode, but for a while it's um, hasn't been the biggest um, in terms of the amount of teams and the amount of players. So uh, through the quote unquote dry spell that the game has had, um, what has kept you guys going playing the game and playing at a competitive level? Uh, Set mix. We'll start with you. Um, I don't know. It's like, for Honor is very unique. I don't know any game that is like For Honor. And for me personally, a big chunk of why I kept playing the game was simply just because I enjoy the game. I enjoy the system. Even though the system is flawed, I still enjoy the system like as a whole. Um, that's definitely a big part. And also another big part is also like if you have a lot of friends in the community and a lot of friends that play the game, you automatically kind of keep playing the game with them. You kind of... You know, you, you you enjoy spending time with them. You enjoy playing the game with them. So it's like, you just keep playing. It's, it's fun. It's cool games. And I would say winning pizza money every now and then from tournaments definitely another factor as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah, gotta have pizza that's, money. Yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Okay, uh, clutch. Uh, what about you? Money. <laughs> <laughs> Not a love for the game, just the cold hard cash. Money. <laughs> All right. Coin. <clears throat> Cheddar. <laughs> Moolah. Your 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 good streaming Dollar community. Arrows. Your Twitch chat. You, you mean my ATM machine? <laughs> 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 you know, like it's 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 the same shit. That, I mean, obviously, obviously, the fact that you know, like I I can make a living off of streaming is a big deal, but. Yeah, like it's literally just the same settings, you know. It's it's unique. It's a unique system. There's n there's nothing that else like it out there. And I, I see a lot of like untapped potential with it as well. Like there are definitely things about it that need to go, but there's also a lot of genuine potential to have a, an extremely fun system with tweaks. Like wh whether we'll see it in this game or whether we'll see either a different company build off of something similar and improve it or whether you know ubisoft montreal themselves will bring out a sequel in several years that will be able to fully capitalize on the um on the like the the system they have like who knows but all i know is is that yes that like it has its flaws the flaws can be very tilting but at the end of the day it's it's unique i have a lot of fun with it and yeah that's also why i continue playing it and why i play it so much for sure yeah I, and i think that's the the consensus with most with most uh people um when they're asked the similar question is like there really isn't a game out out there like for honor i mean more when mordhau came out the combat system was uh, it was obviously very very different and you can't really it, not necessarily able to compare the two um but you could you could attack in the game uh because you there was legitimate mix-ups from basically everywhere um and kind of what I saw a lot of people saying that they wish this was how, how For Honor was, um, and Which I think, huh? Which game was that? Mordhau. 
Uh, I don't know about that one, Chief, but like a lot of people in uh, in Mordhau kind of agree that it's very similar to For Honor, at least at a high level, where like the skill ceiling is way lower for one v one than it is for. Oh, interesting. Okay, well that shows that shows my lack of of knowledge. Good job, podcast host. Good job. Uh, um, but I, I, I guess when when I, I I based that off of watching some streamers playing it myself. Like I watched a lot of Giru um, play the game. It just it it just seemed like when you were you when you press the attack button, you had multiple things that you could do. Um, I mean, yeah, but there, there are also like multiple things you can do in defense to nullify a lot of those options. Like for example, like there's the, like watch someone like trying to attack Giro, for example and he's very rarely going to going to take damage 1v1 and that that's 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 without him regularly playing for 1v1 as well because obviously the comp scene is shifting a lot towards more um like more team games like obviously like it's not as bad as for honor like right but at the same time for honor also isn't as bad as it used to be there are characters in this game that you can deal damage like for ex- for example I, I would argue that um like say hit a Kiri at how it is right now mm-hmm. has better offense than anything in Mordhau. Like that I don't think there's anything I don't think there's anything in Mordhau that like forces like true like fifty fifties that will kill you as quickly as um hit a Kiri will consistently. Like yeah, you you can die pretty quickly in Mordhau if you make like wrong reads or whatever, but right. Hidakuri is like consistently just going to force you into situations that can lead you dying extremely quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is kind of great to see because a, a character that has some uh, that actually has offense now, I think, or at least it feels it feels like it's it's a lot better after the the role changes. Uh, it's great to see you know, it's stuff like this, you know, improving the game because the game is severely lacking in viable offense. And if Hidakuri is actually mix up intensive. Um, I just think it's I think it's healthy. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Is there is there anything else that you guys wanted to add to the topics that we uh, talked about? Mm, not really. No. Okay. No, I don't think so. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I think we covered everything. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, I was going to do a Q and A section, but I don't think uh, nobody's really asked any questions so i think we can just uh end the uh in the podcast here um thank you for both the both clutch and set makes for like i said taking time out of your schedule i know clutch you usually you, you're streaming during this time and i i appreciate you taking time out of that to uh, not playing just to to be here in set mix as well um i appreciate you guys taking the time um yeah yeah so yeah, thanks for having me yeah absolutely uh ho- ho- hopefully next time i can get we can get Danny in here too, because I think he has a lot to offer as well. But um, that'll be for a different time. Uh, but I'm going to, I'll just uh, end stream here. Uh, you guys have a good rest of your rest of your day. Um, good podcast, nice job, thanks, Crack. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, um, uh, for people in my chat, I'll host Clutch, even though probably most of you are going over there, uh, are going over there anyway. Um, that would be. Uh, but yeah. Uh, have a good rest of your day, everybody. And I will be uploading this to uh, the competitive subreddit and to my YouTube channel. Uh, if you guys just are coming in or have missed it, or if you're in uh, a different stream and want to watch the entire thing. So thank you guys so much. And I will see you all later. See you. Adios.